I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science and engineering. My name is Andrew Falkowski, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Taylor Sparks. And this time, we're joined by Will Harris at Zeiss to talk about a really special topic and one that I think you're all going to enjoy. Will, how's it going? Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, it's going great. Hey, and thank you, first of all, for having me on the show here and talk about this cool technology kind of near and dear to my heart. And I think uh, I think your listeners will find this, this interesting and learn a few things, I hope. Um, I'm basically an x-ray tomography guy by, uh, I guess, education and now profession, going back to my PhD career using these instruments as part of my own research life before now entering the commercial industrial side of things and being a, a product marketing guy for this technology and the instruments from Zeiss. Yeah, I saw a bachelor's and PhD from University of Connecticut where you did synchrotron X-ray CT. And today we're going to talk about what Zeiss is doing, which I'm assuming is not synchrotron. So that'll be an interesting story of how you went from one version of the technique to another. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we were using, we were frequent users of several of the synchrotron facilities in the U.S. I was lucky to be working with a PI who was pretty well connected there. Um, so we were doing, yeah, nanotomography. And then I, I sort of knew someone who knew someone at the right time and ended up uh, now working with Zeiss. And most of what we do at this point is lab-based instruments, although we do still sell some instruments and components for, for synchrotron machines. But um there's not nearly as many synchrotrons out there as there are other <laughs> yeah. other labs, of yeah, course. From that a could market use the technology. standpoint, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we can, you know, when I when I when this topic came up, I was thinking about okay, CT. That's a medical imaging thing. What do material scientists have to do with that? So maybe we can start by talking about maybe the motivation for why we'd want to use CT in a, a material science application. Um, just from my perspective, looking at the materials landscape, our materials are getting more complicated. In trying to address all these new challenges, we've had to make much more sophisticated materials. And that's made uh, that's meant that it's a lot harder to look on the inside of those and actually see what's happening, right? We can you know, mount them in an epoxy, maybe polish them down and shave them to a cross section, but that's only a two-dimensional view of a much more complicated system. Yeah, that's right. And I would say, you know, to your your first point there, fundamentally, the reason that we want to use this technique in material science is, uh, to a large degree, the exact same reason that it's used in the medical field, which is we want to see the interior 3D structure of, a, of an object or a sample of some sort without the need of actually physically cutting it open, <laughs> which in the medical world is very obvious why you, you don't want to do that, of course. <laughs> Um, but in material science, quite often the, the motivators are pretty similar, right? Where we want to see what's going on inside your sample and get a three-dimensional sort of depiction of the structures there. Yeah, without needing to do what you described, but like embedding it and cross-sectioning it and, and all the effort associated with that. And at the end of the day, you only end up with a, a 2D depiction of kind of a single slice of the material when you do things that way. And then the other thing is, okay, even if you did slice it, then you get a, a snapshot in terms of time. But if you could continuously resolve the three-dimensional structure, now you could get this 4D sort of capability where you're seeing how processes change over time. Like maybe, for example, you're monitoring crack growth. Uh, very relevant to material science, right? You could see how that progresses over time, but you don't have to like harvest your sample and stop the experiment, uh, which is a total bummer. I've had to do that, right? We had an example where we were looking at delamination of a film, and the only thing I could think of, not having CT at the time, was to just have a, 10 samples running, and sample one, we would harvest after X number of cycles, then we would harvest sample two. And you're just praying that those 10 samples are identical, but that's not going to be the case. Yeah. And even at the same time, you know, in the act of interrupting a sample, you're introducing a change to it. Maybe you're cooling it down and you're allowing certain processes to be interrupted or affected by that. And a number of samples, you know, we talk about, okay, you can mount and you know, polish it down. Some samples are too fragile to actually do that too. You actually risk changing uh, what you're observing. Think about like maybe ballistics damage where there's lots of little shards or, or maybe even composite. You know, sometimes the epoxy doesn't actually infiltrate the material sufficiently. And I've had issues where the epoxy didn't go all the way in. So when I'm polishing a composite, I end up getting fiber pullout 
And so I'm actively changing the surface as I'm trying to, to, to polish it and expose it. Yeah, that, that's definitely true. And, and so much of what people use x-ray tomography for, both in the research world and in kind of industrial settings, is various forms of, of failure analysis or looking at degradation um, or, or damage processes in materials of some sort. And this is always a point of contention, right? The second you you get out your, your knife or your proverbial knife, whatever it is you're using to cut the thing, um, you raise the questions and skepticisms of, oh, hey, okay, we see a crack there. Well, was that crack really there or did you create the crack when you cut the thing open, no matter uh-huh. how careful you tried to be, right? So if we can be non-invasive in that process using x-rays, then it lets us uh, sort of start our investigation from a m- much more confident footing, I would say. Okay. So, Will, before we get further down this rabbit hole, maybe we should back up a minute then and describe the basics of how this principle works. How on earth are we getting this superhuman X-ray vision that we can actually see the three-dimensional structure of materials? How does tomography work? Sure. So we can start with kind of a familiar reference point for X-ray imaging, which is, uh, I guess, the medical world. And and we can all imagine if you're rather unfortunate and you you break a bone, you're going to go to the hospital, they're going to take an X-ray, and they get basically a 2D picture looking through the inside of your, your arm or your leg or whatever it is. And because of the different density of the things inside there, most notably the, the soft tissue, the muscles, uh, and the bone, that generates contrast in the X-ray image. So they're going to appear at different kind of gray scales in, in that image, if you will. So that, that's a 2D X-ray image, sometimes called a, a radiograph. And the way we extend that to 3D is you take a picture just like that, and then you rotate that object a little bit, and you take another picture, and you rotate it a little bit more, and you take another, and you do this um, typically hundreds or thousands of times as you kind of slowly rotate your object and look at it from different angles and take many of these images. And you can kind of intuitively understand at that point that when you do that, you're now building up a better three-dimensional representation of kind of how those things are distributed on the inside of that object. And then uh, we leave it to some uh, computer algorithms at kind of varying levels of sophistication that will kind of reconstruct those into a three-dimensional model of what's actually going on inside that sample. Okay. Maybe jumping back to the the contrast you mentioned. So this is coming from, um, as as I understand, this is coming from attenuation or absorption by these different materials of the x-rays, right? You're you're essentially looking at uh, how many x-rays don't go through. Is that right? Yeah, th- th- that's right. And if you think of um, the, like the index of refraction of a material, right, you have a, a real and an imaginary component, and the imaginary component ba- is basically linked to the attenuation of a wave as it propagates through that material. And so that that's really the primary signal we're using most of the time when we're doing X-ray imaging is looking at that attenuation. Or if you kind of you know invert that, you could say we're looking at the transmission of or, or lack thereof of an X-ray through a sample. And that's going to depend on the local index of refraction, which is kind of most closely related to the density or the average atomic number of that material. So obviously now you've got like two confounding factors because let's say you've got a really big object, the x-rays that will go through like Beer's Law, I'm thinking like Beer's Law, right? The linear path, that's going to cause your intensity to fall off, like the bigger the object, but also the attenuation itself of that material. So you have to be able to decouple between those two things, both the volume and just the intrinsic material absorption uh, property. Yeah, that's right. Of course, yeah, yeah. Denser things will attenuate more X-rays, and bigger things will attenuate more X-rays. So that's that's kind of one of the fundamental reasons why you know a, a single a singular two D snapshot or radiograph of an object um, gives you some information, but you you're of course not able to decouple those two uh, those two factors, and that's why you then rotate the object and collect many different angular um, images because that will then ultimately let you kind of decouple those two variables, right? I see. And so presumably when it comes to resolution, there's a trade-off where if you do many small changes, like if you just rotate it a tiny bit, you can get better resolution at the cost of doing longer scans, longer collection times. Yeah, I would say that's generally true. And, you know, as is the case with, uh, I would say, almost any characterization technique, there's these these trade-offs and, um, yeah, uh, coupled uh, parameters, let's say, <laughs> that you have to navigate uh-huh. between. And um, with X-ray imaging, yeah, certainly true. If you want the the best resolution, the best signal to noise, and, and ultimately the most crisp reconstruction, yeah, you're going to do really small angular steps as you rotate your sample and collect many, many of these projections at different angles. So attenuation is one way of deriving contrast, but 
Um, I imagine, and well, I know that you know elements that are na- neighbors to each other on the periodic table, or maybe organic molecules, probably have very similar attenuation to different X rays. So, are there other techniques besides attenuation contrast that can help us differentiate different structures or, or materials within a object? Yeah, there are, and you know, I would say the attenuation contrast uh, methodology is what's used. I don't know, ninety, ninety-five percent of the time by um, people in uh, sort of material science and engineering type of dis- disciplines. Um, but of course, yeah, as you alluded to, sometimes two different um, materials or two different elements will have very similar attenuation behavior such that they are difficult to distinguish. Um, or you'll have things that are, are very lowly attenuating, right? The uh, low Z elements uh, at the top of the periodic table. And in those cases, the attenuation contrast is uh, effectively nil or, or too, too minor to to de- detect meaningfully. And in that case, um, people have developed what's called, or it goes by various names, but essentially phase contrast methods. And this is not referring to the phase of the material per se, but the phase of the X-ray wave as it propagates through the sample, which if we go back to the index of refraction is related to the real component of the index of refraction. Of course, that will differ also from one material type to another. And it turns out you can detect that signal as well. And sometimes that's stronger in some of these cases where you don't get much attenuation behavior going on. Yeah, I didn't know anything about this when I when I read the review paper to get ready for this episode. I was really surprised. I didn't know that was a way that you could do CT. Um, just reminding our listeners, like if you go back to like our X-ray diffraction, the reason why Bragg's Law, you know, won the Nobel Prize, right? You have coherent X-rays coming in, so they're in phase, and then as the electrons, as the radiation uh, bounces off of the surface of the atoms, right, um, stuff on the surface travels a different length than the stuff that's below it, and so because it travels in a different additional length it becomes out of phase maybe unless you're satisfying Bragg's condition, right? Um, And so coming out of phase, now you have destructive interference. You don't get light coming out. So this is basically the same thing, but tell me why is there a phase shift coming from the materials? Is it like X-ray where there's some additional path length? Is that something else? Like why, why would it shift the phase? Yeah. So you have basically, you know, you can end up with different propagation speeds and and therefore different phase shifts of the X-ray through differing Ah, materials. And right. And then you can imagine when those sort of wave fronts of the X-ray kind of ultimately transmit and reach the opposite side of the material, you kind of get little interference fringes that can develop at the boundaries between one material and another. And if you have the system set up in such a way and sort of small enough detector elements on, on your detector, you can actually pick up that fringe. And so you basically get a little kind of bright and dark highlight at the interface of those two objects. Interesting. Um, so what sort of, I, this uh, naturally probably requires a different sort of CT setup, right? You're not going to be able to just rig your current one to do this. How, because phase from my understanding is very difficult to measure directly. So how do the, what sort of, the devices or technology is used to actually make that differentiation? Yeah, so these things come in a few different flavors. And this is kind of one of the aspects of X-ray imaging, like so many of these, in fact, that sort of originated at synchrotron facilities, which I, I kind of think of as the incubator of X-ray techniques, if you will, before they then start to kind of propagate their way out to lab-based implementations of the method. Um so the, the, yeah, there's different setups depending on kind of what type of X-ray beam you're working with and what type of detector and so on. But on lab-based tools, um, there's, I would say, principally two ways we can do it. One is kind of what's called a propagation phase contrast method, which is you just kind of put an increasing amount of distance between your X-ray source, your object, and your detector, and you create kind of a, a, a nearly coherent type of beam condition. And when you do that, you know, ultimately you're not detecting the phase shift per se on your detector, but rather this interference fringe in the intensity that uh, sort of propagates out for a dis- dis- distance and becomes large enough such that you can detect it. Um, so that's kind of one method. And the other is um, on a different type of instrument using a, a Zernicki phase contrast ring. So it's basically a, a little ring-shaped object that's inserted in the back focal plane of your your X-ray projection that's used to introduce a phase shift that, again, can be detected kind of in a similar way. So that's sort of the long way of saying, yeah, there's there's different flavors of doing it, but ultimately you're trying to convert a phase shift to an intensity difference that you can actually measure. Uh, so... So, Will, this has been fascinating. Uh, I learned a whole new way of doing CT, which I didn't know existed. And I think by the end of today's call today, we're going to talk about another one with diffraction. We'll get to that later. Sure. But um, 
with the x-rays themselves, you know, I'm familiar with x-ray diffractometers where you have, you know, like a, a copper source or a molybdenum source. And so this is, you know, this is producing radiation and it's ideally a single source, but it never really is. So there's this process of filtering and collimation. Do you have similar radiation sources for generating x-rays in x-ray CT? Or is it totally different or what, how does it compare to x-ray, uh, x-ray diffraction? Yeah, I would say not not so tremendously different. I mean, we can kind of broadly bucket things into the two big types of X-ray sources that are used for tomography in, in the materials world. And one is the synchrotrons, which are these big kind of national level facilities. There's a handful of them in the U.S. and I don't know, a couple dozen or so scattered around the world, but but not many. And they're these enormous buildings, accelerators that basically have electrons flying around a, a donut shaped ring at, you know, 99.9 something percent the speed of light. And and when these electrons are accelerated and anytime they kind of go around a corner or sometimes you can steer them through little magnets, make them kind of wiggle or undulate, which is a form of acceleration, they emit x-rays, right? And you can capture those x-rays and then kind of feed them down a beam line, create a, a beam of x-rays and do all kinds of creative experiments with them, including imaging and tomography. So that's one. But of course, you know, like I said, there's only a couple dozen of those out there. Um, and the other one would be lab-based X-ray sources, which of course are, are much more prolific, and they operate kind of fundamentally. I, if I kind of remember back to the episode you guys did on uh, scanning electron microscopy, you know that when you take an electron beam and you shoot it at a material, that material is going to emit X-rays. Yep. And the exact kind of care. And in the case of SEM, of course, you can use that as a, a very useful signal to identify elemental compositions of a sample. Um, when we're talking about an X-ray generating source for tomography in a lab, yeah, you're kind of doing the same thing. You you shoot an electron beam at a metal target of some sort. Uh, I would say tungsten is kind of the, the most commonly used one. And when you do that, uh, X-rays come flying off of it, and you can use those as a an X-ray light source and, and do imaging and tomography with it. So when I was looking some of these different ones up, one thing I came across is that, and, and, and it makes a little bit of sense too, is that when you're just firing electrons at a material, um, you're going to get x-rays off, but you also get a lot of other things. And so they tend to describe those as being polychromatic uh, sources of x-rays in that you'll have lots of different x-rays of different energies that come out versus a synchrotron tends to actually have them much more aligned to a singular energy. What are maybe the benefits or drawbacks to using one over the other? Yeah, sure. So the the great thing about the the synchrotron, as you said, I mean, the, those things produce just orders and orders of magnitude higher flux of of X rays across a broad energy spectrum as well. But the nice thing is because they have so much signal to work with, they can afford to essentially what's called monochromate the beam, or essentially filter out to just a single very narrow band of X ray energies they're interested in working with, uh, and still get you know enough signal coming down to to be useful. And so the advantage of that is you can then tune your X-ray beam to different energy levels, which depending on the material you're looking at may may help you produce better contrast or better transmission through your sample and, and so on. Um, so that, that that's quite a useful aspect of the technology. But on the lab-based instruments, because we have so much less X-ray flux to work with, we tend to not do that. And we use, as you said, kind of a broad spectrum uh, polychromatic X-ray beam that that contains X-rays of, of many different energy levels. and this is a little bit by necessity because we just need that flux in order to produce an image in a, a reasonable amount of time compared to, you know, if you tried to monochromate down, you'd be you'd be sitting at that machine yeah. for, for days and weeks and years uh, waiting for an image to form. So synchrotron, just because of that higher flux, like I'm just thinking about my experience with different SEMs, like I used this lab scale one or it, it, like a tabletop one for a little while. And I mean, it's really great for stuff, but then I went and I, I got to use one with like a nice field emission tip and it's like a totally different experience being able to gather images or take EDS scans in like a fraction of the time. So I imagine for, we mentioned the ability to actually image things in time. The synchrotron really has this advantage with that higher flux, you know, you can gather your image in a much smaller time. So you're, I guess you could say your frame rate or the, the time between captures can be much lower as well, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, if you kind of broadly compare these two sort of instances of the method, you know, the lab-based tool has the the enormous advantage of just accessibility, right? There's so many more of them out there. Um, as far as like imaging resolution, actually, they can be quite comparable as well. But then if we look at the, the synchrotron tools, yeah, they get two big advantages. One is the, the monochromatic effect that we just talked about. And the other is, yeah, because the flux is so much higher, 
you can acquire an image much faster. And that opens the door to doing, yeah, these dynamic experiments where you're really watching an object somehow change and it can be changing pretty quickly uh, in real time and get like this, what people call like a 4D or kind of time lapse movie of what's going on and, and with incredible speed, you know, at the hundreds of, of frames per second in 3D space. Um, oh, yeah, well. So uh, this has been interesting to learn about so far. We've talked about attenuation versus phase angle measurements. We've talked about how on earth you generate the x-rays, but the big elephant in the room for me is how on earth you stitch these back together to get a three-dimensional object. And I asked because 12 years ago, I was looking at a company and uh, I almost took a job doing this thing. And when I got into the math of the reconstruction, it was pretty gnarly. So do you want to talk about that? How much of that you do as a human versus how much you hand over to some sort of algorithm to do it for you? <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question. And um, I guess the good news here is that as a, a practitioner of the technique and a user and, you know, a scientist who really wants to just use the machine and get some some good data out of it, uh, there is virtually zero knowledge requirement for understanding <laughs> what's going on in the actual nuts and bolts of the reconstruction. And, you know, a lot of that technology has been pretty well established for quite a while um, using uh, the industry standard for a long time has been a technique called filtered back projection. And if you to kind of help people paint a, a mental picture of what's going on there, if you can imagine all of these angular images where you've essentially taken x-ray snapshots of an object from, you know, many, many angles as you've rotated around, if you can imagine taking all those images and kind of smearing them back towards a central axis of rotation, you'll sort of naturally start to build up a, a depiction of the the innards, if you will, of, of that sample and the di distribution of different density of materials inside it. So as the name suggests, you're kind of back projecting those images uh, into sort of the, the three-dimensional space. Um, and what's actually going on here is a mix of what's, you know, radon transforms, which is basically this, this angular transform. Um, there's some Fourier domain frequency filtering to remove um, remove some of the the low frequencies that kind of blur your image and so on. But as an operator, the good thing is you 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 don't really need to to worry about it too much. <laughs> Thank heavens. Yeah, in preparing for this episode, I actually looked into it and I was trying to figure out the uh, some of the math and how it worked. And it's gnarly. It, I think conceptually, I have it down, but it's it's definitely it's definitely fairly complicated. It's, Fairly ingenious, the the method that they use to actually reconstruct these. We'll, for those who maybe are still a bit confused, we'll link a couple of articles that have some nice um, depictions of this. And we usually make uh, art for the podcast as well, and we'll include some sort of explanation uh, in an in illustrative manner in that as well. Sure, yeah. And there's also, uh, there's a couple, I mean, people could probably search this as well, good YouTube videos out there that provide like a, a graphical or, or illustrative depiction of what's going on. Um, yeah, and, and we can we can probably share those as well. So, Will, in the time remaining, let's shift gears and talk about applications of this to material science because that's what our audience is going to want to know about. Like, wh why should if somebody works in batteries, or if they work in photovoltaics, or if they work in high strength materials, where would this technique be useful to them? What sort of information could they get from it that they couldn't get from anything else? Yeah, I would say you need to have one or the other or both of the following requirements either three-dimensional structure or, or morphology of your object has to be important in some way, right? If you all you care about is analyzing a surface, this is not the technique for you. You, you got to really care about what's going on underneath the surface with some three-dimensional uh, significance to it. Um, and or you need to be able to do that in a non-destructive way, right? So getting back to our conversation earlier, you, you've got to have a motivation for wanting to avoid or at least minimizing chopping your sample open to get towards that that inside structure, right? So either of those or ideally both of those need to be kind of critical requirements. And and those those actually pop up quite often across the world of material science, as you alluded, things things like batteries, um, we've got additive manufacturing now, people looking at concrete and and so on. Um yeah, it, it comes up quite a bit actually. So maybe we can dive into a few of those specific um case studies or maybe areas of research you had mentioned, um, maybe starting with just batteries. Uh, you linked a couple of articles and we found a couple of ourselves that I thought were really interesting that really leveraged CT's power to show us things that we never really knew before or showed us areas where our designs of different batteries were lacking. Yeah, I saw one recently where it was a lithium ion battery and it showed like my assumption, my naive assumption is that if you're, you know, you know, moving lithium from the anode to the cathode, that it was sort of like 
it would lithiate the whatever your cathode material is made up of. The the portion that is nearest to the electrolyte would be lithiated first, and then it would move to the stuff behind it. And from X-ray CT imaging, I saw that it's actually happening kind of broadly throughout the cathode in all places, which was not, it was counterintuitive to me. And I think that from the description of the authors, it was kind of counterintuitive to the community. And that's one example that was pretty cool to see. Yeah, yeah, lithium ion batteries. I mean, they're tricky, right? Because uh, you have very volatile liquid electrolytes with lithium in there, and like inherently, uh, you certainly don't want to cut one open, right, in ambient air, or it's going to catch fire in your hands, and it's going to be a bad day. Uh, and you know, this made headlines, of course, years ago when some of these uh, earlier forms of the batteries in those uh, Samsung phones or the I think yep. the Boeing Dreamliner, right? These things were just sort of spontaneously catching fire, and it was because there were various overheating problems, and ultimately, then air exposure and uh, what was called thermal runaway and and you know suddenly they burst into flames and so the, they really present a I would say a ripe case for x-ray imaging where you want to see what's going on on the inside without this messy business of trying to figure out how to cut them open right and there's lots of reasons as you allude that people want to do that to understand you know the charge discharge cycling what's actually happening in the materials where is uh, deformation or potential uh, problem spots developing but you can see this as you kind of go back and forth in the charge cycling and I would say kind of either in situ or kind of quasi in situ type of imaging experiments. Yeah, one of the papers we looked at was uh, comes from Paul Shearing's group. He, at the time, I think he was at the University of College London. Now he's at Oxford. But they studied this thermal runaway in lithium ion batteries. And they did something really cool where they actually had a thermal image recording at the same time as they were doing synchrotron X-ray real time. So they could then correlate the actual temperature change with the voltage change they were inducing with then uh, physical change that was happening within the material. And so they could actually see various stages of delamination within the battery cell and then correlate that to changes in temperature. And then what was really cool is I think they they went back and they did, they did actually a couple different ranges. So you had kind of mentioned early on in your introduction, you were working with nano CT. So depending on the resolution you're looking at, right, you can have nano, micro, and then maybe something a little bit more in the macro scale. But they used a couple different ranges going all the way down to like a pixel resolution of about like 63 nanometers or something. Um, but they were able to actually go back and then kind of do some interesting thorough investigations and look at how that structure changed before and after and even identify because of that attenuation contrast phase segregation that was happening uh, within the electrode materials. Yeah, and people do this a lot in the the lab based instruments. You know that they can't collect the data nearly as quick as the the synchrotron facilities, where, like you said, they did this kind of real time imaging of thermal runaway, which happens in you know a matter of seconds or fractions of a second. But in the lab based instruments, the the strength you have is you can image something and then put it through some test or exposure, or in the case of batteries, charging and discharging however many times you like, and then you image it again and, and rinse and repeat, and you can do this as, as many times as you like and, and sort of watch the long-term evolution of these structures. And like you say, at, at either the micro scale or in some cases even at the nano scale where, yeah, you're getting down into the, the tens of nanometers kind of uh, spatial resolution. So, Will, a question I keep on having as I'm thinking about this is the same with microscopy where as you're bombarding a sample with, say, an electron microscope to analyze it, which you have to use. If you want better resolution than visible light, you got to use something with a smaller wavelength, so we use electrons. But these electrons are also, like, tearing up your material depending on the accelerating voltage and the material it's made up of. I remember looking at a polymer when I was an undergrad, and you could literally see, like, the raster pattern. You'd zoom out, and you're like, oh, I just carved away my material. Do you see similar concerns with X-ray CT, depending on the energy of the X-rays that you're hitting it with, that what you're observing is maybe not the real material because you're modifying? It's that age-old thing, right? When you observe something, you've changed the material, the thing that you've observed in some way. Is this an issue with X-ray CT? Yeah, I would say, you know, it comes up from time to time. Um but uh, sort of on aggregate, relatively minor issue. And the, the reasons mostly being that the energies we're using and the fluxes that we're using are actually relatively low compared to what uh, most materials can tolerate. Um, you know, we see this from time to time in, in things like really low density polymer samples. If you scan it for a really long time, you'll actually mm -hmm. witness like a, a, a very visible like color change. They'll, they'll kind of darken and things like this. So, you know, there's, there's something going on in there. But for the vast majority of things, there's there's, I would say, minimal to no effect. And of course, you always want to kind of do a sanity check there and maybe observe with some other techniques and convince yourself that you're you're not changing the structure. But um, 
you know, the, if we go to kind of the opposite extreme, there is an area where, you know, people really look at this quite closely. And that's in the biological world where there's there's certain X-ray CT machines that are made for scanning like live mice and things like that. Right. And certainly there you've got much stricter kind of dosage guidelines, <laughs> namely much lower dosage you have to, to navigate in order to not damage, in that case, the, the organism. OK, yeah, that makes sense. Before we depart from batteries, there was another um, sort of case study that I found that I thought was really cool. It came out of Vanessa Wood's group at the Laboratory for Nanoelectronics in Zurich, and they were actually looking at charge and discharge cycles um, with some novel electrodes. And what was kind of interesting is during lithiation and delithiation, the um, electrodes actually undergo a, a mechanical strain. And so they were they were expanding and then contracting, and that actually resulted in them fracturing and slowly degrading over time, even just after the first uh, lithiation cycle. And so just through that, they were able to just monitor maybe the mechanical response of these materials uh, in situ and in operation, which is something that just would be nearly impossible without uh, a tool like CT to be able to do that in real time. I think I saw another article from Paul Shearing's group where they did the same thing in a commercial battery where they were able to then correlate basically the um, diffusion of lithium with the strain of the battery itself. And what was kind of neat is even in something that's state of the art or used in devices today, they were able to identify areas of low strain, which meant differences or heterogeneous uh, diffusion profiles within it. And I think that just highlights and across all of these different case studies, the thing that I routinely kept finding was because of tools like CT, a number of fundamental maybe assumptions or views of how these materials operate were sort of upended, or at least they were refined and um, improved through the use of being able to monitor these processes in real time. Yeah, and in batteries in particular, one of the the kind of hot topics um, where this has come about has been in uh, silicon anodes. So graphite has been used as the standard anode material in lithium ion batteries for a long time. And it's quite stable, but it doesn't really store all that much charge, right? So if you're, say, working to build an electric car and you want it to go, uh, I don't know, 600 miles on a charge instead of 300 miles, you, you really got to figure out a way to store more charge in a charged battery. And so putting silicon into those anodes has proven, or I would say has emerged as a possible way of doing that because it can hold something like three times as much charge as graphite. But the problem, as you suggest, is that actually when you, you pump lithium into silicon, it expands volumetrically quite a bit. Um, and so the chemistry or electrochemistry here and the mechanics are really closely coupled. And when people looked at this in sort of silicon in isolation, the problem isn't so evident. But as soon as you have it within an actual battery cell and you can look at it with something like tomography, you see that this expansion and contraction of the silicon during charge and discharge cycles, uh, yeah, is problematic, right? Um, you end up with fractures and delaminations and things like this that start to happen uh, that are really complex and, and also quite bad for performance in some cases really quickly bad for performance early in charge discharge cycles. So yeah, um, understanding how that evolves mechanically uh, turns out is super important. I've got a great follow on to that. So in lithium, in the, in the scenario you gave, silicon, when it gets lithiated, it can expand by up to 400%, which is a massive expansion. Um, so I would assume that's pretty easy to see because it's growing a lot. But this kind of gets to my underlying question, which is what are the resolution limits with X-ray CT? And I know that that's a complicated answer because it depends on the energy you're using. It depends on the size of the sample. But do you want to talk a little bit about resolution? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah, it, it is certainly a complicated answer. And, um, you know, it, it depends a little bit on the, the architecture of the instrument as well. Um, you know, what type of detector you're using? Is it kind of the industry standard sort of what's called a flat panel detector? Basically looks like a, a flat screen TV type of thing that you're projecting an image onto. Um, or using optics. Uh, in one of our instruments, we use scintillator coupled optics. It's basically a way of achieving higher magnification um, than you otherwise could. Or there's some flavors of machines that use actual X-ray focusing optics, things like uh, diffractive zone plates uh, to further magnify an image. So um, depending on, on these uh, different designs, I would say anywhere from the micron scale or a little better than a, a micron kind of spatial resolution down to, in the case of the the instruments using optics, um, tens of nanometers as possible. So th things Holy on the cow. order of, of 50 nanometers or so, yeah, kind of um, pushing it to the, the extreme end of the range, I would say. That's rad.
So maybe stepping away from batteries, those have a complex internal architecture. Another class of materials that does are composites. And this is where I think CT has actually found a lot of application is looking at these complicated composite structures, not only after fabrication, but also maybe during failure. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the case studies you're familiar with there? Yeah, and I, I think you had kind of alluded to that earlier, Andrew, when you're talking about um yeah, com composites, of course, have very different failure mechanisms than kind of standard metallic engineering materials, right, where it's pretty well understood kind of how, how you know, cracks form and propagate and so on. I'm generalizing here, of course, but when you have composites or things like fiber composites, um, suddenly that's very different, right? Like what happens to a crack when it starts to propagate through the material and it hits a fiber? Or what if a fiber breaks, but the surrounding matrix doesn't? Or what if you've got voids at, at interfaces of sort of neighboring fiber layers, what impact does this have under maybe fatigue or tensile load or things like this is is maybe not at all similar to what we're sort of traditionally used to looking at as as material scientists and engineers so being able to get a three-dimensional look inside and and try to observe those things as they start to form uh is really a unique capability that that x-ray imaging brings so you know, we talked earlier about how attenuation is 90 whatever percent, 90 plus percent of the cases. But in these composites where you have such bad difference in your attenuation, are you increasingly using phase, you know, information to, to achieve the contrast? Yeah, sometimes this is an area certainly where it can come up. I mean, often you have a lot of uh, carbon based materials here, right? Polymers and, um, you know, carbon fiber, com uh, carbon fibers in many cases. Um, so, you know, and sometimes this phase contrast method is it's not really a binary thing where you have just attenuation information or just phase information. Oh, you can kind of configure the instrument. Think of it sort of like a sliding scale, right? You can say, like, I want my signal to have like some attenuation character to it, but a little bit of phase enhancement that's going to kind of make the edges of the interfaces between these different objects like kind of pop, so to speak. And that, yeah, that can end up being quite helpful when later on you're processing the images and trying to, you know, tease out, you know, where's a fiber and, and where's the matrix. I'm thinking of electron microscopy where you don't just look at the secondary image, you also do backscatter, you also do EDS. You'll often lay these images right next to each other and say like, okay, the the aggregate is more information and I can sort of interpret that way. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say, yeah, that's a pretty reasonable analogy, yeah. And there were a couple of cool applications of CT with composites. I think uh, Brian Wardle's group at MIT, they, when you're doing this layup for composites, there's always an interlayer or interlaminar region where you don't have fibers. It's essentially just going to be that epoxy. And that ends up being a weak point, right? Because you don't have your, your stronger material there. And so they had this cool idea of actually just filling that region with uh, carbon nanotubes that are oriented preferentially kind of um, uh, to a transverse to the axis so that they acted like a Velcro almost. And with CT, they were able to then simulate failure and see in real time and in, in 3D um, cool you know, crack deflection away from that intralaminar region into the, uh, or away from the interlaminar region into the intralaminar region uh, where the material is stronger. Um, and I think that'd be very difficult to observe um, using maybe traditional methods. You do risk maybe damaging your material um, another example I saw that's actually very close to me. So I, I came from the nuclear industry and we were working on composite fuels. And in a lot of these, you basically have a bunch of particulate fuels that are in a, a spherical shape that are composites themselves being put into some sort of container. And so the question was always, okay, if you put these in here, um, a common math problem is like packing spheres in a container, right? They're not always going to align the same way. And so the question was, do we have differences in density um, around our object? Are there some geometrical features that promote better or worse packing? Um, and it also allowed us to look even deeper and look at irregularities within those particles too. And um, a guy named Joshua Kane at INL is doing a lot of really interesting work there. I looked at another one of these papers. This was out of Germany at BAM. Um, and it was talking about using X-ray to look at damage in laminates. And this one kind of felt like overkill to me because, you know, we did a previous episode on like ultrasonic and I feel like you could have gotten similar if maybe not quite as highly resolved information from ultrasonic, right? Do you see that there's a lot of instances where people are using x-ray just because they've got it? Is there a balance that has to be struck here between, you know, much lower cost, lower fidelity techniques versus the higher fidelity ones like x-ray CT? Yeah, I, I, I think that's fair. I mean, these things are complementary. Certainly, I, I, you know, I wouldn't advocate one is better than the other per se. And and especially in the world of composites, we do see, you know, ultrasound being, you know, it's quite a prevalent technique, of course. And um, 
I would say really where the x-ray technique comes in is if you really want to get down to kind of the fundamental um, sort of uh, matrix and, you know, filler material, whatever that may be, fibers, kind of level length scale and understand at a very discrete level what's happening there to a crack or a void or, you know, a fracture in an individual fiber and so on. And draw some kind of steps to a better phenomenological understanding of like what's actually happening in the mechanics that would lead to things like, you know, delamination and so on that you'd certainly pick up with ultrasound. So um, again, complementary, right? So maybe helps to enhance sort of the, the research level understanding of what's actually going on. Yeah, that makes sense. And, I th you know, the composites world that's being used here is, is pretty broad. I've seen even some articles looking at different concrete mixtures, which are themselves composites and are actually becoming quite complicated based on my cursory glance. But maybe we can shift over to 3D printing because I think that's where CT has found a lot of applications, specifically in, in laser bed printing where defects become important, right? Companies produce these parts and they want to maybe use CT to either diagnose printing parameters or also maybe scan parts um, before they're put into production to look for certain flaws. And I think there was some really cool research there. Um, yeah, there's been a ton going on in this area, as you mentioned. Yeah, it's a, a lot of um, yeah laser-based, uh, laser powder bed-based methods where, yeah, you basically have this, this powder of small particles of metal and a laser goes over it in some certain pattern, melts those areas, and you do this layer after layer and you build up a 3D object, um, essentially sintering it or micro sintering it layer by layer. And what people find, of course, is the, the CAD model that you give that machine and tell it what to build, and it can be incredibly complex. This is one of the advantages of, of 3D printing or, or additive manufacturing is to build like these really complicated 3D geometries. What you tell the machine to make is not always what it makes, <laughs> right? And so you can imagine you you give it some some crazy structure, but then, I don't know, because of residual stresses or local heating effects that evolve during that printing process, you actually accidentally get some deformation in some area that pulls on some other area and, and so on. And suddenly you get something that's a little bit di different shape than what you intended. And if that's happening somewhere inside your object, you're never going to see it uh, unless you're looking at it with something like x-ray tomography. Yeah, I remember when we did a 3D printing episode, there was a whole kind of um, aspect to actually not necessarily catting your part to the true geometry, but catting it to the as printed geometry. Yeah. And that's really hard to do, right? Like you, you usually do like a sweep. So you print a bunch of standard geometries that are easy to measure, and then you kind of back calculate or estimate shrinkage along different uh, axes, and that's how you update it. But with CT, you can directly see um, to a, what sounds like a very good resolution the sort of shrinkage and where that shrinkage has, happens in your part so that you can adjust uh, it from there. But one of the things that I thought was really cool is uh, in, in some of the papers I was reading is we understand that things like pores or maybe surface roughness or other sort of geometric issues can be problematic for the material. But I think up until now, there was some assumption that, okay, you know, porosity is bad, we want to remove it. But using CT and kind of correlating that with the performance of these materials, there was a lot of interesting work showing that, no, not all porosity is bad, or some porosity is worse than others. And that's what we should what we should be targeting. Um, for instance, they were showing that below a certain size, right, the pore actually doesn't matter too much for strength, but it does actually have an impact on ductility. And so if you're scanning a part for quality, right? The, the lower resolution you go, I imagine it takes much longer to actually complete a scan. But if pores beyond a certain level or below a certain threshold don't matter, you can oh, tune yeah. your pixel cool. size to that. Um, the other thing was that some pore types were problematic. And so they were able to uh, correlate those with printing parameters and adjust and optimize those to remove those specific pore types. I think the last one that was interesting is that the, the location of that porosity matters. So for like fatigue properties, they found that pores within one millimeter of the surface were particularly detrimental for basically being flaw initiation sites. And so being able to identify those as the root cause of your fatigue properties was uh, able to be done through x-ray tomography. Yeah, and I would say taking it even a step further, right, if we can sort of take this notion of, oh, hey, you know, the distribution of, of how we build things in this object, you know, things like pores may matter a lot where they are. Well, what if we can take this and actually use it to our advantage and say that we're going to 3D print this object and we're actually going to use, say, different laser parameters 
at different locations within that print to try to inspire different properties locally, right? So if we want different ductility or different strength at different locations within sort of nominally the same material, let's say, then maybe we now have some flexibility to do that, but it may create changes or uh, unexpected changes in the structure as well. And so we can we can use a tomography technique to try to, say, scan the left side of the object and then the right side of the object where we perhaps had different processing conditions and see if is there a noticeable geometric effect on what we actually got out. That's rad. So, well, this podcast is about the past, present, and future of material science, right? And so the same thing with X-ray CT. I'm excited to learn about what's on the horizon. So we kind of have a couple different areas from new contrast methods to time lapse, you know, imaging and new reconstruction algorithms. Do you want to talk about new contrast methods, in particular using diffraction maybe as a contrast mechanism? Yeah, so this is one that's come about, um, well, I guess I would say overall in, in the last decade or so, and it's been now on a, a lab-based instrument, one of the ones we offer from Zeiss for, I guess, the last six or seven years. Um, so I, I guess many people know x-rays in the lab uh, for XRD, right? A diffraction-based technique that you can use to look at, at crystal structures. Um, but in an imaging sense, it turns out we can leverage diffraction as well, because of course, anytime we're shining X-rays onto an object, if they're crystalline objects uh, and they satisfy the Bragg condition at that given X-ray energy and orientation, you're going to get diffraction, right? And so if we set up our instrument in a little bit of a special way to actually collect those diffraction signals, then we can rotate our object the same way we do with regular tomography and collect many, many diffraction patterns across many different angular uh, orientations and use a, a clever reconstruction approach that's a little bit different than the normal reconstruction approach. But we can sort of backtrack where those diffraction patterns originated from within our object and build up a 3D depiction of the the polycrystalline grain structure. So like, where are the grains? How big are they? What's their shape? What's their crystallographic orientation? And that's info that we, we were just never were sensitive to previously when we were just looking at attenuation signals. So this is like 3D EBSD. I mean, I, I'm guessing you're probably aware of it, like folks like Teresa Pollock at Santa Barbara have like their tri-laser where they basically ablate it and they're doing EBSD as they go. And so they're able to destructively carve away into your material and reconstruct what the material grain structure looked like because they're doing essentially three-dimensional EBSD. But the catch is that they are ablating it as they go. And you could probably achieve the same thing, I don't know, with the same resolution, but the same principle without destroying it with this uh, sort of approach. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a good comparison, right? If you're familiar with EBSD, which is natively a 2D technique, which as you say, you can extend to 3D if you sort of slice up your, your object as you go. Um, yeah, we're kind of getting, I would say, similar type of information in 3D but doing it in a non-destructive way. And there, there's some boundary conditions and trade-offs there, of course. Um, as you mentioned, EBSD can get to higher resolution, right? Can see smaller grains and, and things like that. Um, but the non-destructive method using x-rays and what we call diffraction contrast tomography uh, can be quite useful if you want to do kind of like what we were talking about before, these sort of time evolution studies where you, you look at an object numerous times through some changing conditions. And one of the kind of obvious ones that people have been exploring in these early days of DCT is looking at a grain structure and then putting typically that, that metallic system through some heat treatment. And of course, we expect that to, to change the grain structure, or re refine the grain structure, and then we can look at it again and actually get these kind of before and after pictures in 3D of exactly what's happening and changing there. Yeah, I think it was, uh, you linked this great article by, or well, yeah, yeah, from Greg Rohr at Carnegie Mellon. And they, they studied basically uh, apparently 52,000 grain boundaries in a nickel polycrystal undergoing a heat treatment. And it actually brought up a, a disagreement with what was assumed to be very fundamental. For a long time, it was assumed that grain boundary motion was largely uh, correlated with the curvature of that grain. Um, but after analyzing all of these grains undergoing this heat treatment, they were able to analyze this in real time. They actually found that it was uncorrelated and that there were other macroscopic features that were better correlated and better predictive. And so their work has highlighted perhaps a, a flaw in some of the fundamental equations that have been used to predict and control so cool. grain formation and materials. And it also brings up this funny kind of idea, right? We always say like, well, all models are wrong, but some are useful. <laughs> and we've gotten this far using potentially a flawed model. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to see, you know, with 
introducing these diffraction methods and being able to understand materials and how they evolve in real time at such a, a resolution that's never been done before, what sort of new things we can we can uncover. And I think, um, Taylor, do you want to talk about that other interesting case study that he linked? Well, yeah, there's the one that he linked and another one that I found, it was just this August, it's relevant, right? They found a fossilized dinosaur egg that had an embryo that was intact inside of it. And like, this is such a one of a kind, like you cannot reproduce this. And if you want to investigate it, like that's the type of tool for X-ray CT. Uh, the, the other one he linked is a, a similar situation where it's a meteorite, right? You don't just like <laughs> call up Sigma Aldrich and say, I'd like a chunk of meteorite, please. Um, these are rare. And so if you want to investigate them, non-destructive is, is a big deal there and great tool to do it. Yeah, and I think that that particular case, which was um, a sample and a little bit of work that we did with uh, some folks at UT Austin, was, um, I believe, the first instance of using this diffraction contrast method to map out internal grain structures within one of these little uh, meteorites that was, I don't know, it was very small, you know, two, three millimeters in size or, or something on that order. Um, but the first instance of actually non-destructively seeing what's going on with the grain orientation and distribution inside the object. So yeah, that was pretty exciting. So, so another, so that, that's a new contrast method, right? But maybe some of the other one is we talked a little bit about being able to monitor things in real time, but as the technique has developed and as we've been able to take these images faster, I imagine there's all sorts of new um, ways to capture different processes uh, in, in real time now because of CT as well. Yeah, that's right. And, and people have gotten pretty creative, I would say, right? There, there's kind of some obvious things you can do, which is when you mount the sample within the machine, you can put little rigs in there that will either, you know, pull it in tension or put it in compression or, you know, raise the temperature or lower the temperature of it and so on. Um, some people have built little in situ electrochemical devices to do uh, kind of micro scale or sort of simulated battery experiments, if you will, um, or corrosion and so on. So the, the list goes on and on. I mean, that's kind of one of the great aspects of the the technique in general is, you know, you don't have the constraints of, say, like a, a vacuum environment that you need to consider the way you would with like an electron microscope or, or many other techniques. Um, and you also have like a fair bit of uh, just physical space kind of flexibility within the instrument to work with. So you can, you can do these types of things, you know, poke or pull on your, your sample and, and watch what actually happens. And yeah, there, there've been a bunch of great papers and one in particular recently that came out, um, a collaborative effort from some of your colleagues at university of Utah, uh, and Sandia to look at, um, an additive manufacturing sample, going back to what we were talking about before, and put it through compression and look at how cracks were propagating there because due to the microstructure they were creating, it was not necessarily the same as the way cracks propagate in kind of a traditionally manufactured sample. So that's, uh, yeah, one great example of, of you know, the, the insights that you get from, from doing this kind of non-destructive time-lapse imaging. Another great link you've provided is on dendrite growth, right? So I show my students every year in my intro to MSC course, these videos that show at least like the two-dimensional cartoon schematic of how dendrites grow. And it's it's a fascinating topic, right? Because it's all about um, if there's a protuberance, right? So if there's something random happening, does it extend into a region that causes it to redissolve, in which case you won't get dendrites, or does it uh, augment that growth. And so then it just continues to grow and you, you see the growth of these dendrites. And it's one thing to show them a cartoon, but how cool to actually see in this link, the dendrites growing in real time in an actual three-dimensional structure. Very, very cool. Yeah. And what was interesting about that particular paper is that they, they found that the, the 3D model for modeling dendrite growth in a solidifying metal was actually, it differed from the real-time measurements. Wild, man. Yeah. Like, major shout out to, to Peter Voorhees at Northwestern. I mean, he's really been the pioneer of of a few of those experiments. And yeah, to, to your point, exactly the, the visualizations he's produced as a result of those studies that really showed, they, you basically get these movies that almost look like computer generated animations, right? Of, of dendrites kind of growing in real time and the, the, the sort of time span of seconds um, that I, I think nothing helps us better to understand really physically what's going on there than that, that direct visualization of it. I mean, that's kind of right. The science is based off of this. Hundreds of years, it's been about what we can observe. And once we can observe things, we hypothesize. And what we have with micro CT, well, X-ray CT is a new observation medium, a really powerful one. Okay, so the last thing we want to talk about is new reconstruction algorithms. You've talked about, you know, filtered back propagation. You've talked about, uh, what is it, radon tomographs, what are they called? The radon transform. The radon transform. <laughs> uh, are these sort of the best in the biz, but are there new things coming out now? What, what's in, happening in the world of reconstruction algorithms? 
Yeah, I guess uh, in a nutshell, quite a bit. Um, it's definitely an active area. It's something we at Zeiss are, are working on quite diligently. We've got a couple kind of commercial products out there doing some new things in this area. And there's a, a handful of research groups um, getting creative as well. But I would say, you know, that uh, the biggest problem that these things are all trying to address is to squeeze more useful 3D information out of less uh, input information, let's say. And, and this all often comes in the form of like, you know, ideally you want to collect as few of these angular projections as you possibly can get away with, right? Because it just takes more time, the more of them that you collect. So if you can say, just take 300 images instead of 2000, then that directly translates to a faster scan. But, you know, the problem when you've done that traditionally has been if you're just using filter back projection, which is what everyone's used for, oh God, I don't know, a couple decades now, um, you start to introduce all kinds of spurious signal and, and noise and artifacts into your reconstruction and you kind of end up with, with sort of garbage, right? But if you can be more intelligent about the way you handle those reconstructions, and I guess we can, you know, we can maybe touch a little bit on uh, at least some of the methodology there, you can potentially end up with similar quality or perhaps even better quality data at the end than sort of that, that baseline sort of long scan case that people are, are used to doing traditionally. And so maybe we can dive right into it. One of the articles you provided was Zeiss using machine learning to actually augment this reconstruction. And the results in the paper were phenomenal. They show, you know, they do 150 scans or something and then 600 different angular scans. And they show that with the 150 scans, the um, the reconstruction method that Zeiss developed, actually, it looked better than even the 600 scan one um, using only 150 scans. And I thought it, it looked, you know, very... Uh, it looked great. And so can you talk a little bit about the development of that and where where that's kind of going? Real quick, I just think it's funny that we like cannot do an episode without talking about machine learning. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> Me and Andrew just love it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly everywhere, right? I, I guess it's no surprise that it's made its way into x-ray imaging amongst uh, just about every other technique in material science these days. And, I, and I'm not a machine learning algorithm guy, so... Um, probably beyond me to get into the, the real nuts and bolts of it here. But, you know, fundamentally what we're trying to do is, yeah, get, get high quality data out with less projections. And you run into two main problems when you collect less angular images during your tomography scan. You get um, increased levels of noise, and that's just kind of like random shot noise, Poisson noise that you get in any x-ray imaging technique. That's just going to be more prevalent when you have a uh, reconstruction based on less images. And the second problem you get is... Um, kind of an undersampling problem, right? So anyone who's done tomography before knows that if you don't collect enough angles, you get these kind of like streak or sort of ripple-like patterns in your reconstruction yeah. that aren't aren't truly random, right? It's this kind of almost sort of blurry kind of wave-like looking thing in in your reconstructed images. And that's because you you haven't sampled enough of that that angular domain. Um, so it turns out we can train a machine learning model to pay attention to both of those predominant sources of uh, what I'll call just inaccurate or spurious signal and be able to tease them out from what's actually from one or the other of those problems and then what's actually signal from the sample and do a pretty good job of, of removing those those artifacts and noise. And so you end up with a, a pretty crisp and clean and low noise reconstruction, even with relatively few images. And yeah, I mean, the the results, uh, I would say, to echo your point, are, are sometimes surprisingly good, right? Um, it's still kind of early days of this technique, but we, we're definitely uh, surprising ourselves over and over of um, the quality that it produces with relatively little effort. Are there are there issues with maybe, you know, finding something that isn't there? Are there, there are issues where maybe the noise uh, overcomes it or is, it's interpreted in the wrong way and maybe a feature is is, is created in these reconstructions that, that isn't actually present in the sample or you know, from based on what I was reading in these articles, it's it, they're using a somewhat deterministic approach. It's not just feeding a big network. And so I think you can avoid by kind of tailoring the structure of that to the actual problem. You can avoid kind of hallucinations is what they're calling it. Yeah. But do you still find that in, in some of these new reconstruction techniques? Yeah, I, I mean, it's an entirely valid question, right? And, um, you know, I think any diligent scientist, uh, especially if they're starting to work with new materials or changing their methodology a little bit, will need to go through some validations to convince themselves what they're seeing is, is you know, physical and reasonably representative of their sample. But, you know, if I kind of take a step back from there, the, the way I always kind of look at this is, well, 
you know, as we discussed earlier in the episode, probably you nor I nor many, many people using X-ray tomography could derive in detail how filtered back projection reconstruction is done today. Right. And that's just because this has been used for so long and there's so much collective experience in the community that we kind of know what happens in the reconstructions. We've got enough intuitive understanding to be able to look at them and say, OK, I think that's physical. That might be an artifact and so on. And that's just because we've been doing this for, oh, God, I don't know, a couple decades yeah. now. Right. So I, I think, you know, it won't take too long before we get to a similar point with these new methodologies where we've got a similar level of understanding of um sort of what are the boundary conditions of its validity or where can we ex start to expect it to to break down a little bit. Um, I would just say anecdotally in our kind of, to be honest, relatively limited experience with it so far, we're more likely to get, uh, I guess I'd call it false negatives or essentially like missing feature, small features that might be there rather than creating these sort of hallucination, sort of fake features out of the blue. Um, but yeah, I, I, we're always doing comparisons of these machine learning based reconstructions with kind of baseline regular reconstructions as as sanity checks as kind of any reasonable person would when they're they're first starting out with it. Um, so maybe the last thing is segmentation. Um, I'm excited about this because the our neighbors right in computer science are doing crazy things with segmentation. The tools are just so good. I'm thinking of like the segment anything model that came out last year from Facebook. I mean, just they're amazing. I assume these have also been applied towards the um, tomography space where now not only you can collect these images, but we can actually very easily parse out what is what you can draw boundary lines really clearly. Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. I mean, and if I go back to my own PhD career, which was about a decade ago at this point, I mean, the, the segmentation pain point in processing, I, I guess I would say images in general, but certainly tomography images because it's 3d data and it's just inherently more to work with. Uh, just a, such a tremendous pain point and so much time lost of poor grad students staring at computer screens, you know, with their <laughs> yeah, eyes starting to bleed as they, they try to tease out what's one object versus another. So uh, machine learning is, is changing that really, really drastically, thank God, um, to the point where with pretty minimal training input, you can click a few buttons and you get a pretty darn good kind of first guess at, you know, here's object A versus object B versus C and so on. And so you know, a lot of this is starting in the 2D world. It's just a little bit simpler, but it's it's making its way into 3D tomography data really, really quickly. And um, yeah, making uh, all of our lives in the the research space quite a bit uh, quite a bit easier, I would say. Pretty awesome. Well, this has been a fantastic episode. I think when I started looking into this, I I, I knew a little bit about CT, but I didn't quite realize how influential and how impactful it could be in the material science space. And we're really fortunate to have been able to talk to someone who's an expert in it. And I think we've done a, a great job of covering this. So this is a great episode. And uh, any any final remarks, any last things you'd like to leave us with, Will? No, I, I, well, thank you for having me here. It's been great. And I'd say, you know, I, I hope people are, are interested or looking into the possibility of how x-ray tomography might apply to their own material science or engineering work. And I, I would say it's it's one part of the toolkit um, amongst, you know, electron microscopes, optical microscopes, other analytical techniques, and they all kind of bring their relative strengths to the table. And, and here it's really when you need that that internal 3D information, it's, um, it's really come of age and um, been an exciting area to work in. This episode of the Materialism Podcast was sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Zeiss Microscopy is engaged with material scientists worldwide who are constantly trying to tease out the connections between processing, properties, and the performance of new materials. At the center of these connections, at the micro and the nanoscale, resides material structure, as well as the characterization tools that make it visible. Building on over 175 years of innovation in microscopy, Zeiss is proud to offer an extensive suite of optical, 3D X-ray, SCM, and FIB SCM microscopes to help scientists and engineers understand their materials. Every Zeiss, micro every Zeiss microscope comes with the commitment of providing the highest quality instrument, deep application expertise, and a robust global support network. Whether you're in industrial R&D, whether you're in industrial R&D, failure analysis, academia, government research labs, semiconductors, or any other area where materials microstructure is critical, consider Zeiss next time you're in need of new microscopy technology. This episode is sponsored by California Nanotechnologies, or CalNano. If you've listened to the podcast, you know that we are big fans of them. We've done a couple episodes with them, and I, as a professor, have used their services multiple times over the course of my career. They have some really great services. They've helped us with spark plasma sintering at an extremely large scale, way bigger than what you're thinking. They can make some huge components. 
I've always had great success with them. They turn out high density, quality parts <laughs> to order and pretty quick turnaround. Um, and they also have some other capabilities, including cryo milling. Check out our episode on that. We think that they're an awesome company and we're proud to stand by them as a sponsor of the show. The Materialism Podcast is also sponsored by Materials Today. Visit materialstoday.com to stay up to date on the latest happenings in the material science field and read some fantastic articles they have published. You can head over to elsevere.com to find out more about their journals, books, conferences, and related programs. Okay, thank you for listening to this episode. It was super fun to have you along. Uh, and as always, we would love to hear feedback from you. So check us out on Instagram. We are at the at materialism.podcast handle, or you can send us an email, materialism.podcast at gmail.com. And if you want to do me a huge favor, I would love it if you gave us a review. We are tantalizingly close to stealing that number one spot in the chemistry category. Nothing would make me happier than to have a material science podcast in the number one spot of our chemistry homies. So help make this happen. A review, share it with some buddies. That would just be super rad. Um, as always, we're grateful to the people that make the music for this. That's Alphabot and Colobite. They make some cool stuff. Check them out. And we'll see you next time. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton. The makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials.